Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. Welcome back to the Endless Knot, where we are finally back from summer hiatus and ready to get going on another season. Except this isn't that. This is the last episode of season three, and we want to report on this summer when we really haven't had many podcast episodes and let you know what's coming up for the season to start. Woohoo! <laughs> so, do we have any business b- before we get into things? Yes, we do. We have a little bit. We want, as always, to say thank you to new Patreon supporters and an ongoing thank you to all of our longtime Patreon supporters. But Indeed. we have. We have new supporters, uh, Chris McKinney, Adri Cortesia, sorry if I got that wrong, Tim Hammock, and Alexander Partridge, all of whom have either increased their support or become new patrons in the last couple of months. And thank you very, very much for helping us. Thanks, guys. The other sort of business is our plans for this upcoming new season. Now, the seasons are rather arbitrary, but we've (laughs) kind of decided the last couple of years that new seasons start in September because... We follow the academic schedule. And so for us, September is New Year's. Specifically, the Monday after Labor Day is New Year's. Labor Day being North American holiday that falls on the first Monday (laughs) after the first day of September. Not first of May, which is what Labor Day is elsewhere anyway. (laughs) That's a discussion for another day. The point is... That this September will be the beginning of season four. So the beginning of our fourth year of podcasting. Wow. Yeah, it's a little amazing to think that it's that many. This is episode 60, though. Mm -hmm. So that tells you something. Um, I think this year we're going to commit to a minimum of one episode per month. In the past, we've been trying to do once every two weeks. But at the end of last year, by the spring, we were really hitting once every three weeks. And some of it was just a little too much, trying to balance all of our work, teaching, and other actual paid commitments, along with video production, which is our main, which is a major focus for us, trying to do our one major video a month, and then some smaller videos. Trying to do the podcast every two weeks was getting pretty tough. So going forward, we're going to try to make sure we have a minimum of one episode per month. That doesn't mean we won't do more than that. And I think we will probably quite often do more than that. But it will depend on our timing, availability of guests, how much energy and free time we have to do things like editing. Editing the podcast does take me quite a long time. So... For you, not that much will change. Uh, There will just be the occasional month where there's only one episode. Yeah, yeah, that's basically it. So I just wanted to let you know that. Uh, I hope you don't mind too much, but it is just necessary for at least the next little while while we get our feet under ourselves. Our other commitments vary from time to time, but this year upcoming, for me in particular, is going to be quite a full year, I think. One last thing, there is a podcasting conference coming up in the fall. It's November 2nd and 3rd at Harvard, and it's called Sound Education. And it's going to have a bunch of educational podcasters speaking, doing workshops, giving talks. The keynote address on the Saturday is Dan Carlin. Of hardcore history. Great educational podcast fame. And there's a bunch of other people speaking, including some of our friends, like... Uh, Doug Metzer from uh, Literature and History, which I don't know how much I've talked about that on this podcast, but you should listen to it. It's a great podcast. And Ryan Stitt, whom we've definitely talked about on this podcast, who does History of Ancient Greece. Um, Also, Kevin Stroud from History of English and a whole bunch of other people who are also equally good. We are currently debating about (laughs) whether or not we are going to attend, not in the capacity of presenters, just as attendees because it looks amazing. It's really a matter of timing and budget. So we're going to see. But if you happen to be anywhere near Harvard for November 2nd and 3rd, or could get yourself there, I would strongly recommend checking it out. Uh, It's just soundeducation.fm if you want to look for it. 
and uh, check that out and see what it, whether it appeals. There's an early bird registration before August 31st, if you can get to it before then. All right. So we're going to be talking to you about where we've been this summer and why we haven't had podcasts. <laughs> and to do that, we are going to accompany ourselves with a drink. Indeed. And so this drink is reflective of the second part of our summer activities. Specifically, it is a kind of schnapps, basically, from Iceland. Akavit. Yeah. Akavit, called Brennevin, which is basically the same thing as brandy, literally the same thing as brandy. Brennevin means burned wine, mm -hmm. as brandy, brandy wine means exactly the same thing, burned wine. But this is a clear spirit, not aged in a yes. barrel or anything like yeah. that. And this particular Brennevin is flavored with dill and seaweed. Mm -hmm. So very ocean appropriate. Mm -hmm. We had some while we were in Iceland and it was delicious. And then we picked up a bottle on our way back home uh, at the Duty Free in Iceland. So, skull? Skull. <laughs> it smells like salmon. I mean, there's no actual fishiness to it, mm. but it smells like it does because it's so dilly. And seaweedy. And seaweedy, yeah. Mm. It's really nice. It's not sweet at all. It's savory and it's very tasty. And we've put granite blocks that were in the freezer in to be cold and a little bit of Icelandic water. I should correct that slightly. It should be scowl, yeah, not well, skull you're in Icelandic. You speak Icelandic, I don't. Well, you don't speak Icelandic, but you <laughs> no. correct Icelandic. <laughs> I, I pretend don't. to speak Icelandic. <laughs> All right, so where have we been this summer, Mark? Well, first of all, let's start with June. And mm -hmm. the big activity for June was going to VidCon. I can barely remember. Please remind me what we did. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know, VidCon is the sort of premier online video, I want to say conference, but actually it's more of a convention, I think. is probably Yeah, a really convention as a, as a start. Yeah, it's not run by YouTube, but it's largely YouTube content, largely YouTube creators who mm -hmm. are there. Yeah. There's other kinds of online creators, but it, it started as a YouTube thing and it is still mainly a YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. And the particular reason we went this year, we haven't gone before, but this year, the thing that sort of convinced us to go was a one day pre-conference Mm -hmm. called EduCon, which was initiated by the collective, I don't know what we call ourselves. Let's go with collective. collective I like that word. Of educational YouTubers called We Create EDU. Mm -hmm. Which and we've been part of for a couple of years now. Yeah. It was not started by us, and we are very grateful to those who started it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it was exactly what we were looking for, what we needed at the time when we found it. And we are so grateful to be a part mm -hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. By the way, if you're interested in knowing more about We Create EDU, there is both a Twitter and a YouTube channel with that name. And I would strongly encourage you to check it out because you'll find there a whole bunch of channels that are wonderful. We do, you know, retweet and mention and sometimes promote various of those channels as well. But if you want to, you know, I, I can't list them all here because there's a whole bunch of them. But definitely look at the We Create EDU feed if you're interested in just finding a whole bunch of really great channels in history and science and literature and like just everything. We'll put links in the show notes. Yes, for sure. And this group sort of came up with the idea of doing something. Last year, they had done a kind of more informal, mm -hmm. just sort of a get together, really at VidCon and this year and before it they done it it was before it last yeah. year yeah and this year they wanted to do something a little bit more elaborate and so uh we we kind of um partnered with YouTube to plan this one day event mm -hmm. and so YouTube kind of got behind it they were really excited about the idea and funded it funded it and and you know got a location for us and we planned sessions mm -hmm. basically workshops or discussions mm -hmm. to you know either learn new skills or talk about issues that face uh, educational youtube creators mm -hmm. and it was fantastic yeah it really was it was amazing it was overwhelming yes <laughs> 
Uh, VidCon itself was also overwhelming, but really EduCon was even more so. But it was amazing. There were things we learned. I still haven't actually gone back to my notes and I have a few implemented notes and we any haven't of them. Acted on any no, of them. because well, because we came home and then we went off yeah, on our other yeah, trip yeah. and then mm-hmm. we've been back and and we just haven't had time. So I do have notes for specific things to do to help with our videos, to help with our podcast a little bit, mostly our videos, and also to in to help with building community around our viewers and listeners. So those are useful. But the big focus for me of it and the big benefit was just being able to be in the room with a whole bunch of other people with the same passions and concerns and desires and intentions yeah and to learn from them and just to really just to sort of bond yeah Yeah. (laughs) essentially yeah it was particularly fantastic to to sort of meet face to face with the wce people people yeah we've known known for a while Mm -hmm. online but never met in person Mm -hmm. that's really the theme of this whole summer for me this summer and the trips we've taken the theme has been the absolute surreal delight of meeting old friends for the first time Mm -hmm. the wce people were the first stage in that walking into the restaurant that first night yeah. Um, we arranged to meet up for dinner with people before the thing actually got started, walking into the restaurant and seeing 15 people and giving them all hugs while we said, nice to meet you, <laughs> because they were people we knew and had had lots of interactions with before, but had never been in the same room with. Right. And that sort of set the tone for the whole EduCon and VidCon, but also the whole summer, really, because as you'll hear, similar things happen later. And it was it was really amazing. Like it was really genuinely moving and wonderful Mm -hmm. to be um, with people and to feel part of that community. Yeah, it was a big sort of boost to the sort of motivation Mm -hmm. and uh, kind of emotional support Mm -hmm. of doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Being a video creator, being a YouTube creator, being a podcaster, all of those things you know, we're lucky that we have each other at least. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people don't even have that. Yeah. But we do have the two of us. But even so, especially with the videos, it can be very solitary, that creative process. There's no, we don't have a team. We don't have an office that we go to to do this work mm-hmm. for you in particular, I think. Mm-hmm. And what WCE, We Create EDU, has provided for us has been that community. But always up to this point, very valuable, but still virtual. Yeah. And to have it be sort of really there. Yeah. And to see these people and be able to sit and chat and hang out and was just like, yeah, (laughs) indescribable. Yes. (laughs) So in addition to meeting all these people who are so important to us in We Create EDU, these these close friends and, and colleagues, we also got the opportunity to meet people that we hadn't known about really before, either people who are, you know, other edge YouTubers, either people who are big names or other people that we hadn't heard of before. Mm -hmm. And from all of them, we were able to learn new ideas, new ways of thinking of things. And it's good to have that broad kind of range of experiences, Mm -hmm. everyone from the smallest channel to the, you know, big, you know, Mm multi-million subscriber channels and so forth. Yeah, and to also see the wealth of what's out there. People doing, you know, city planning and music and... Teaching science through music. Yeah, and just a bunch of, you know, things that I didn't know were out there necessarily before we were there. And then the surrealness of talking about the World Cup with John Green, which if that doesn't mean anything (laughs) to you, that's fine. But it was a thing and I did it twice and... And Rosianna as well, because the World Cup was going on while we were there. Right. That was a thing. (laughs) That was odd. Chatting with Tom Scott was really nice. He's such a nice man. He was, yeah, he was wonderful. He was really nice to talk to. That felt really nice, but not quite as surreal. I think there's something about John Green is just too, (laughs) was more surreal. And he was so clearly exhausted too, at the same time as he was talking to us all, which was kind of entertaining. Mm. But yeah. So yeah, there was, and then some other larger names too, whom because whom I don't know as well because I'm bad and don't actually watch as much YouTube as I should. <laughs> <laughs> Though that was in- an interesting theme while I was there was the number of people saying know, yeah. no, no, it was the number of people saying yeah, I don't actually watch much YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah. Because of course, a lot of YouTubers don't watch much YouTube. 
Because they don't have a lot of time to do so. Yeah. And they'll watch a few things or try to keep up with stuff in their own area or their own friends or whatever, but actually don't spend a lot of time watching other people's YouTube because they're making their own. So the shame-faced confession, well, I don't actually watch a lot of YouTube, <laughs> was made more than once and made me feel a little bit better about my uh, lax. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the one day Educon and it went from 9 a.m. to 7 Mm -hmm. um, and it was very intensive and really good, but long. Mm -hmm. We slept until like noon the next day, I think. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, you slept until noon. I woke up at about nine and then watched World Cup soccer <laughs> till noon. And that was VidCon. I don't know how much to say about VidCon itself. Well, the itself. rest of it, yeah. yeah. We, we went to some sessions, not nearly as, as I much. I went to like but... one session a day. Yeah. <laughs> the next three days. <laughs> I did a lot of sitting on a couch outside the sessions and talking to other creators. I just sort of hung out on a couch mm. and watched people go back and forth to sessions. You went to more. Yeah. Um, but it was great because because we'd met a whole bunch of people at Adicon, we had people to hang out with and mm. we knew people and we continue to you know make those connections many of which we hope will result in collaboration mm -hmm. uh, with our channel and making videos with them in fact some of those are are we're working on right now mm -hmm. and you will see the results of those over the next few months if you're watching the videos and i think for me one of the big kind of discussion points that came up there, so there were a few sessions on, that specifically focused on the humanities on YouTube. Mm -hmm. There was one on Educon itself and another, there was, there was a, 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 a panel, panel and then and a, a meetup. Workshop, yeah. I guess. yeah. Yeah. The, the networking meetup. Yeah. Networking meetup about humanities in educational YouTube. And one of the things that sort of occurred to me and that I don't really have an answer for is that science on YouTube is doing great they're really able to kind of get their message out and get people excited about science. Mm -hmm. And humanities is kind of struggling in that. And I think it's largely a part of branding. Science, you know, they can they can talk about SciCom and, you know, you can mm -hmm. say, uh, I'm a scientist. But there's no good term for that if you do humanities. You can't say, I'm a humanist. That means something very different. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what a good sort of umbrella term is. So I, I don't know that we're going to find one. I don't no, think there is one, I, to be no, honest. No. Yeah. But humanities tends to get siloed a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, in the science, even if your particular interest is physics, you'll you also... You can go under you the can, broad sci scientist. Science. And, you know, you'll still have some appreciation for biology videos or... And there's a commonality there's there. There's a commonality yeah. there. So I don't know what the answer is, but if you have a term to suggest, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Humanities itself is not a term that really means anything no. outside of academic circles and or people who self-identify as humanities scholars. But yeah, yeah the, we have the, we just don't have a good word. You get, you know, in in popular culture in, in, on TV and films, you get someone who is a scientist and can somehow do all kinds of science, <laughs> even though, you know, they're a biologist, somehow they're experts at doing, you know, everything, everything. Yeah. Um, which is obviously infuriating to real scientists, I'm sure. But there's just no equivalent. There yeah. is just no equivalent. No. no. And our liberal arts is the term that's often used as a general term in the States anyway. Yeah. It's not any help. You know, you're not a liberal artist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though perhaps you are. But yeah. Yeah. The the other big thing that came up in that is that people come to YouTube or Google with a question about science. Mm -hmm. A very specific question very often. And you can make videos that answer that question. But people don't know what questions they might ask of the humanities. Right. To ask them. They don't Google them because no. they don't know how should I think about the world mm -hmm. is a really broad question. Yeah. And so a lot of the videos that people make and that people are interested in, mm -hmm. but they don't find them because they don't come to ask them. Yeah. So unless they happen upon something and when they do, they might think, oh, that's really cool. I never thought about that. I'm interested in thinking about that. But because of the way discovery works on YouTube and on the internet in general, if you don't know to ask the question in the first place, you'll never find it. And yeah. so that's just a sort of ongoing problem as well. Yeah, unless you're a student who is trying to Google, you know, what does Hamlet mean or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
But that's not really the kind of question that most no. humanities channels are answering anyway. No, no. It's, you know, I mean, there are a few and that's fine and that's mm-hmm. good. But so it, it is complicated and, and one that we certainly didn't answer. No. But it was nonetheless kind of helpful to sit in a room with other people going, yeah, I have the same problem too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because it, it does make you feel a little less alone. All right. So that was VidCon. The other thing I want to say about VidCon is just how... I haven't been to California very much and how very California it was. We were just outside of Disneyland, like blocks away from Disneyland. We didn't go to Disneyland, but other people did. Just the like palm trees and the Disney stuff and the restaurants and And the the crowds. And the purple jacaranda trees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It was just very California (laughs) and very American and very, very different. Like... Sometimes when you're in Canada, you don't think that the U.S. is very different from Canada because everything sort of seems so homogenous. Mm-hmm. Now, California is its own thing. But yeah, but still, I was like, no, no, this is this is a different country. Things are, are definitely different here. And I can't put my finger on all of those things, though I could tell you about. Yeah, California is is really nothing like Michigan. No, no. But still, it was it, for we don't travel a whole ton of a lot. Yeah. So it was a. It was a big deal for us to go, and it was pretty cool. And to be on a trip without our kids. Yes. (laughs) First time. Since they were kids. Since they were born. Yes. So that was June. Mm -hmm. Then we came home, and we had like a week and a half at home, and we recorded that little quick quick announcement for you. And then we headed off to? First of all, Iceland. Mm -hmm. With the kids this time, Mm -hmm. on a family trip to Iceland and England. Iceland, we met uh, Mark's sister there, and we spent five days, and then we flew to, uh, she went home, and we flew to England. So we're not going to do like a, here's our vacation slides. <laughs> <laughs> but we thought we'd talk a bit, little bit about some of the highlights of the trip. If you'd like to see where we went, go to the YouTube channel, I'll put a link in the show notes, where there's a video of the etymologies of all of the place names of all the places we went yes. and some pictures that we took along the way and some video. So that can give you a little travelogue if you want to sort of see every place we went. So we won't do that now. <laughs> but we will talk about some of the things that really struck us on this trip. And I guess we should start with Iceland. So in Iceland, we just stayed around Reykjavik. You know, there's lots of things to see in Iceland, but we were only there for, what, five days, I guess? Five days and with the kids and we didn't rent a car. So, yeah, yeah. just didn't recommend it. But there's enough. I mean, we'd never been there before and there's enough things to see mm-hmm. uh, in Reykjavik or near Reykjavik that we didn't need to really travel around much. So one of the first things we did is go on what's called the Golden Circle Tour, you know, the sort mm-hmm. of really kind of famous spots near Near Reykjavik, Reykjavik, which included the famous geysir or geyser. I don't know how you want to pronounce it in Icelandic. It's actually a proper name, the geysir, from which the word geyser comes from. So Mm -hmm. all geysers are basically named after this first one Mm -hmm. uh, near Reykjavik. Which is, you know, a hot steam outlet of the volcanic activity that is under all of Iceland. Yeah. And we saw a waterfall, Gullfoss. But the thing for me that was really exciting was to see Thingvellir, which is the location of the early Icelandic parliament, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, in the Middle Ages, when settlers started coming to Iceland, they set up a a parliament. Mm -hmm. Um, they, They went to get away from the kings in Scandinavia and just, mm-hmm. you know, kind of. Which set is why Iceland is one of the earliest democracy. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not really a fully representative democracy. We call it a parliament, but really it was a bunch of people getting together and voting on and things. And voting on things. You know, yeah. it was not like they were electing MPs or anything no. like that. But yeah, it was a democratic council. Yeah, known as the All Thing. Mm-hmm. And specifically the Law Rock, where the speaker would stand and recite the laws, which originally was done from memory. You know, this is back in the oral days Mm -hmm. before written stuff. So, you know, this location is mentioned in all the sagas and the family sagas in Mm -hmm. particular. And so having read about it for so many years, it was very exciting to be there and to, you know, stand on that spot. 
Yeah, no, it was. And the thing is, coincidentally, I guess, I mean, no one's ever suggested that it was anything but a coincidence. The spot they chose for this parliament also happens to be the division between the two tectonic plates that meet in Iceland and cause all the volcanic activity. So right behind the law rock is this huge wall of stone, this sort of cliff that's sort of receding away. <laughs> caused by the ground dropping as the North American and Eurasian plates move away from one another. And it is like visually stunning. It is quite astonishing. I'll put a couple of pictures in the show notes just because. And uh, our kids were, they didn't really care about the history stuff <laughs> of this part of it, but they were really interested in the geological part of it because they, they like continents. And so you can sort of stand with one foot on the Iceland on the <laughs> European plate and one one foot on the North American plate, and it is like truly beautiful and am amazing to look at. There was they talked about how uh, Game of Thrones was filmed there. Yeah. I mean, it really is astonishing countryside, and it also has this historical importance, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed that too. Plus, that's when the sun started coming out on our trip which was very rainy up till that point. So yeah. I like that. And mostly rainy the entire time we were there. But yeah. 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 And we saw, you know, the various museums, the settlement museum, which has a excavated remains of an early settlement in the mm -hmm. Reykjavik area and the national museum, which has a wonderful collection of artifacts. In particular, I was excited to see what is known as the Eirarland statue, which represent is is meant to represent Thor. Though people have said uh, that it could possibly also be Christ, but in fact, probably it's sort of Thor, but with syncretic elements of, with syncretic yeah. elements because it comes right around the time of the Christianization. In Iceland. It's a small little figurine that little bronze doesn't figurine, yeah. perhaps seem as exciting and significant in some ways, but it's a very cool and interesting little figurine and very, very important because it seems yeah. to mark this sort of moment mm -hmm. of transition. Um, so to actually see it. Yes. Yeah. And then you bought a replica. I bought a replica. <laughs> <laughs> see if you can spot it in the background of his videos. Yes. Yeah. I think my favorite items in that museum in particular were the carved doors yeah, and and walls, but the car wall panels, but doors, um, with the sort of I think sometimes we think of those as Celtic, kind of the braided, yeah, um, interlaced, interlaced pattern, patterns. That's what it's known as yeah, but they were they're really just beautiful and just wooden doors from like twelve hundred mm -hmm. A.D. And <laughs> the other thing that was my favorite was not Viking at all. It was the um, there was a tankard. A stoneware tankard that had been imported, for, imported from Germany in the 16th century. Uh -huh. And it had on it three people sort of carved onto it. One was Alexander the Great, one was Julius Caesar, and one was Judas Maccabea, Maccabeus. Yeah. And all in like 16th century armor <laughs> on this tankard. And it wow. was just like... I don't it, remember that one in particular. I'll, I'll, I'll put some pictures. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it just I took pictures of all three of the images. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was an imported... A uh, high status item. Right. Yeah, that was what it was there in the museum for. But it was just so sort of <laughs> random. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just, and I really loved the Julius Caesar in his 16th century, century armor. armor. Yeah. <laughs> and Judas Maccabeus. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I really like those. They also had a, a Viking coin hoard, mm -hmm. which was mostly Anglo Saxon coins. So this sort of drives home the the whole Dane Geld, you know, they would pay off the Vikings to go away. Yeah. And, stop and attacking the Vikings would come home with a bunch with of Anglo Saxon, Anglo -Saxon loot. coins. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was all in all, I mean it was just we stayed near the water, near the ocean, and that was amazing. And we saw the presidential residence and yes. that was amazing. Yes. <laughs> and like it was just really cool. It was a really great trip. I Definitely would like to go back. I recommend visiting there. The swimming pool. Yes, the swimming pool, the hot pool. So these are thermal heated pools. S swimming pools, though, but not not like I mean, everyone's heard about the Blue Lagoon, and I'm sure they're amazing. Yes. We didn't go to those, and I'm sorry we didn't, and I'd like to someday. But these, these are just, just like neighborhood pools, community pools, like 
the YMCA kind of pools. Mm-hmm. And outdoors, though. Outdoors, and they're thermally heated, and they've got hot tubs, and they've got jets of water, and they were just amazing. And they were clearly sort of social mm-hmm. spots where people would go at the end of the day to just hang out with their friends mm-hmm. and chat. Old people and young people, yeah. like everybody. Yeah, it was great. We went there three nights in a row. I just want that in my life, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> So yeah, really enjoyed Iceland. We also got to try a number of different Icelandic beverages, uh, beverages, including the one we're having now, and some beer. Beer is a kind of new thing on the scene. It was not legal in Iceland until relatively recently. The 80s? Yeah. Well, and also, I mean, everything in Iceland, most of the tourist stuff is very new. Mm-hmm. And quite, you know, it's really recent that there's been such an influx of tourists. So they're still the kind of producing yeah. an, a tourist industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but doing a great job of what they're producing, I think. Like, it, it feels a nice mixture. It still feels authentic and reasonable and straightforward, even though it's clearly meant for tourists. Yeah. Like, they're saying, here's what our country is. Mm-hmm. And things like the gin. There was a number of ki- types of new craft gins. Yep. Clearly, this is, you know, getting on board with the craft gins, but why not? Mm-hmm. And then the Brennavan and and that um, birch-flavored. Oh, yeah. That alco- was really nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Really interesting. The other uh, thing that I just wanted to mention, because I think in some ways it was one of my highlights, was a bit odd, but the Volcano House. Oh, yeah. Where all it was was a place where Mm -hmm. you went and watched a couple of documentaries. Mm -hmm. Like, it sounds like it's more exciting than it was. It really was just movies in the back room. With a few little specimens of minerals minerals inside. But the first documentary in particular, which was about the Westman Islands eruption... Uh, Westman Island in 1973, I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. It was about basically, um, there's the little island off the coast of Iceland where one day, completely without warning, an eruption started. Like, not on a mountain, just a bit of the ground opened up and suddenly there was an eruption. Now there's a little tiny hill mountain there, but there wasn't then. And it covered a big part of the town and, you know, it was... It's quite devastating, but... And the efforts they put into... To stopping it and, like, stopping the lava from taking over mm-hmm. most all of the town and then cleaning up from the ash afterwards. And I just, I really found it fascinating. Yeah. I would definitely recommend, I'm going to put a link, just learning a little bit about that particular eruption. I just found it really, it was mm-hmm. a 1970s documentary, so it wasn't yep. fancy or flashy or anything. But I found that really interesting and just seeing the people sort of coping mm-hmm. this little fishing village. But it was a little fishing village, but as I said, it was also like the biggest fishing village in Iceland in that it produced yeah. the largest amount of fish. It had you know, a big economic impact. And it really yeah. mattered that they kept mm-hmm. it going because it had a good harbor. And mm-hmm. if they didn't have it, you know, suddenly they had no fish in mm-hmm. all of Iceland. So I thought that was really fascinating. If you'd asked me before, that would not have been what I expected to be interesting. I thought in particular your, one of your highlights would have been the Penis Museum, given your own personal predilections. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me sound really problematic. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> well, I was going to mention that. So there is this place called the Phallological Institute and Penis Museum, and it's just a little storefront, really. And we went to it because of, you don't not go to it, yes. obviously. And it was fine. It was fun. It was, you know, entertaining. But I will say it wasn't really all that interesting to me. Hmm. What it is, is mostly a collection of specimens and specimen jars. Yes. Physical, like, collections of the actual penises from every mammal on Iceland. Yeah. Whales. A lot of whales. A lot of whales. Seals, walruses, cats, dogs, horses, you know. Yeah. All these things. And some other silly things along with that and stuff. Uh, and that's fine. And I'm not saying that's not interesting. But, you know, I mean, they're just bits of flesh. <laughs> I thought it had a disappointingly small amount of cultural information. Right. Like, no, that's not what the guy's stated aim. The guy mm-hmm. who started it said he sort of started collecting penises of animals in Iceland. And so he that's what this is. So fair play. Like, you make your museum about whatever you want to make your museum. And he has some artifacts and things. And he has little bits of information about yep. penis and folklore and stuff. There was... But like the thing is, there's a huge amount of yes. cultural importance of the penis. Yeah. And a museum that actually talked about the importance of 
the phallus and the penis in all sorts of even if just in Norse. Yeah, there was myth. a brief mention of the the story, the mythological story of the settlement with Skavi. So the the Aesir, the gods, had to make settlement with her for the death of her father. And oh, yeah, one yeah. of the stipulations was they had to make her laugh. So Loki achieved this by tying a rope around his testicles mm -hmm. and the other end to a, a billy go goat. Yeah. Mm. And they would tug back and forth and he'd sort of scream, scream in and agony and agony. Stuff. And it made her laugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, but, and, you know, there's like just, you know, the cultural importance of phallic imagery mm -hmm. and, and the anthropological importance of the penis. I was disappointed in how little there was on all of that. You right. know, as somebody who, as I will mention later, is very aware of how many Roman depictions of the penis there are, for instance. Right. Not to say that there should be Roman stuff in an Icelandic museum, but like, if you're going to talk about the importance of... Anyway, so it was fine. Yes. And I was amused to see a Draugr penis. If you've been <laughs> following our, our videos and stuff for some time, you know what it, that a Draugr is a kind of Icelandic zombie. It's, yes. it's like a ghost, but more physical. And so they had a supposed Draugr penis. So yes, which was sort of ghost-like. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, there was, there was cute stuff. It there was, was, cute it was stuff, funny, but... There was an empty jar that was the Hildurfolk, the... Uh, the elf the, penis. The elf yeah, penis, an elf penis, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean, like, I... I I don't regret going to it at all or anything, but I just, I feel like it could be more. Could be more. It could sure, be more. Sure. Because in fact, it's not just a joke thing. Like penises mm -hmm. are really an a big deal in, norm, in human and, yeah. history, mm -hmm. you know? So anyway. There will be, by the way, a vagina museum. Yes. In fact, in I will works. put a link to that because they are fundraising and looking for a space in London, I think, mm -hmm. to, to hold them. So I will put a, a link to the vagina museum. Which was inspired by the fact that there is a penis museum mm -hmm. and the feeling that there ought to be mm -hmm. a correlate. But we have not seen it because it does not yet exist. No. All right. So that was Iceland. Yes. And then we headed off to England. We flew into London and spent just a few days there. I mean, given how much there is to see in London, obviously. <laughs> it was totally impossible yeah. to spend enough time, no matter how much time we spent. But also, it's really expensive to stay in London. Yes. And the rest of our time in England, we were staying with people and didn't have to pay for accommodations. So we kept our time in London to a minimum. Yes. So, I mean, we saw a few cool London things. The first day we went to Abbey Road. I'm a big Beatles <laughs> fan, as you yes. may or may not know. So I went and crossed the crosswalk. <laughs> yep. Our kids were completely baffled as to why we were at this random place and totally unimpressed by it. But yes, we have a picture. And of course, we went to the British Museum. Yeah, that's as you would imagine. definitely my highlight. I mean, we saw a couple of other museums, but for the moment, that's my highlight. Yes. And it was overwhelming. Even though we didn't spend very much time there. No. Yeah, it was it very was, there overwhelming. Was so much. We saw there. the Rodin Greek art exhibit to yes. start off with, which mm -hmm. was great. And that one we spent enough time to actually take in, I think. Yeah. And what was amazing there, particularly, was the, the Parthenon marbles, the El so called Elgin marbles. Yeah. Not all of them, but a whole bunch of pieces from there. And to stand next to these quite astonishingly beautiful and also extremely famous and important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. works of Greek art from the Parthenon was really special. And it was neat that they paired them with sculptures by Rodin that were inspired mm -hmm. by those, those yeah. Greek originals. Yeah. And so to be able to compare them. And I learned a lot about... Rodin's sort of inspirations and process. I didn't know anything much about so Rodin, forth. to be honest, before. I knew I knew a little bit because I saw a, a biopic about Camille Claudel, and I've mm. been a, kind of a fan of hers since I was a teenager. And so there was a piece connected to her there, but mostly it was Rodin's work. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't know is that he was inspired by Dante. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of his early, I guess it was a commission initially, that was the the gates of hell i guess oh yeah that he he did this big sort of monumental work mm -hmm. called the gates of hell which has all these different statues on it then each of those individual pieces he also did as separate pieces yeah he kept coming back and, yeah. to it and re well th that was what i found interesting about the whole rodin yeah. process was this i hadn't really thought about it but when you're a sculptor who works with casts mm -hmm. Um, you know, the number of different versions of the yes. same image that mm -hmm. he did and re repeated versions and repeated. And he would come up with an idea and then other people would sculpt it for him mm -hmm. to his vision. And, you know, it's it's much less 
individual and singular than I really thought it was, I guess. So yeah, yeah no, so the, it, that was quite interesting. And then we did a really quick, <laughs> comparatively quick canter through two galleries, basically. Yes. Yeah, we did a sort of beeline through thousands <laughs> of years of human history. <laughs> we had to walk, we had to get to the Anglo-Saxon room, which was in a far corner, sort of a, a, a hollow square. The Mu British Museum is this upper floor. It's a hollow square. And you come up the stairs and, and we wanted to get the Anglo-Saxon room, which was in one corner. And to get to it, we had to get through a bunch of other rooms. And we ge genuinely, I had to put my hands beside my face <laughs> and block out my vision and just walk because it was very crowded and we had yeah. a certain amount of time. We had to be somewhere at a certain period because everything we walked past was like a treasure of the world. You know, the Egyptian rooms with mummies and stuff and wall paintings and treasures. Mm -hmm. And then the Babylonian and Mesopotamian stuff with pictures I've seen a million times in textbooks. And, mm -hmm. and I just had to like, I can't stop. If I stop and look at any of this, I'll never leave. I just have to walk. Yes. I just have to ignore the fact that everything I'm walking past is like a once in a lifetime opportunity to see. Yeah. And just head for the Anglo-Saxon room that we need to see. <laughs> so I got to spend a bit of time in the Anglo-Saxon room and I saw the Sutton Hoo artifacts, which were just amazing, you know, mm -hmm. seeing the, the famous Sutton Hoo mask. A picture of which is on the wall behind Mark every time he gives a uh, does the videos, yes. which you've probably seen there for. But yes, to actually see the thing mm -hmm. itself. It was just, yeah, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And the Frank's casket really kind of, you know, made me speechless. Mm -hmm. um, it's beautiful. It, it, really it is, is just gorgeous. And uh, this is one an artifact that I mentioned very specifically in a video about what's the earliest English word. Mm -hmm. And one of the candidates is, you know, this kind of first word on the inscription of this artifact, the word fish. Mm -hmm. So I got a picture of myself pointing to the word fish on the Frank's cassette. Yeah. I took a whole bunch of pictures in the British Museum and elsewhere that we may or may not ever use in a video, <laughs> but we just wanted to take pictures. Mark was like, take this and this and this and this and this. And uh, so that if we ever want them in a video, we'll have them. Yeah. So you may or may not see pictures turning up in videos from now on that we took. <laughs> and then we went on to the Greek and Roman rooms, some of the Greek and Roman <laughs> rooms, there's because so many, I mean, there's yeah. so much. <laughs> Mostly we looked at the Roman stuff. We were getting tired by this point. It was very hot because the museum is not air conditioned and it was very warm. And the Greek and Roman galleries in particular have glass roofs. <laughs> so it was very warm in those rooms. And by this point, I genuinely was sort of overwhelmed to the point of not really being able to handle it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, after the, the Parthenon stuff and then coming into rooms where... Every case had something that I had seen in a textbook yeah. or used in a class mm -hmm. or taught with, you know, a vase or a statue or a, an object or whatever. I kind of couldn't deal with it. Like I couldn't look at everything and I couldn't, I just, I just couldn't handle it, frankly. So I looked at a few things. I didn't take any pictures really of anything, partly because it was so sunny that the reflections on all the glass right. made them bad, so it didn't help. I took a selfie with, with a penis wind chime. Yes. Because that was important. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you, your, your predilection. It's, for... It is on brand, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we went, and then like we moved into a room where all the busts were. Mm. And there were all the marble busts of all of the emperors every one of which is the image that you use when you talk about that emperor. Well, yeah. Most of them. You know, here's Hadrian. Here's Lucius Verus. Here's, those were the pictures. And then in particular, Augustus, you know, the mar the marble bust and the bronze bust of mm -hmm. Augustus with his um, staring eyes. They're just never there. Like, if I were a bad museum goer, I could have touched them. <laughs> I didn't because I'm a good person, you but I could have. I could have, like, kissed them. Yes. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I did take a selfie with one, which you can see that I'm a little overwhelmed because I'm kind <laughs> of crying. But, yeah, so we took some pictures. And it, so it was, it was amazing, but, like, the kids were utterly over it all yes. by this point, too. So they were totally ready to go. And we had somewhere to be. But... You know, obviously, I'd like to go back mm -hmm. and just go to the British Museum 12 or 15 times mm -hmm. and do each one for like an hour because I don't think I could ever do more than an hour at a time. Mm -hmm. 
part of it, it just felt like it's unreasonable for so much stuff to be in one place. And that's kind of because it is. It yeah. is actually unreasonable for all of this stuff to be in that one building. Yeah. Like historically unreasonable. Mm-hmm. And I know there's a lot of arguments about what to do with artifacts and all the rest of it. I kind of feel like they should be redistributed around the world. Yep. Quite apart from all the other reasons, just so it's not so <laughs> ludicrous that they're all in one place. Yeah. Like well, just to make it more reasonable yeah. to go and see a set of important objects yeah. and then go some other country and see another set of important yeah, imagine objects. if a meteor fell out of the sky or something and oh yeah destroyed the building yeah. so yeah so that was the british museum yes now there's another museum speaking of the kids that i want to mention very briefly but they chose the imperial war museum that's what they wanted to see yeah. that's true and it was very interesting yeah it was the first world war stuff was really cool yeah Yep. But the particular thing that I want to mention just because of connections to a video mm-hmm. is they had a little section on Bernard Montgomery. Oh, yeah. That's right. You made me take a lot of pictures of that. Yes. Monty, as uh-huh. is affectionately known. Mm-hmm. Field Marshal Monty. So I mentioned him in connection to the cocktail of the Bellini, and he is also connected to a particular type of martini called the Montgomery, which is 15 parts gin to one part vermouth, because that's the the ratio of troops that he liked to have on the battlefield, 15 of his men and one part of his opponents. I mean, who wouldn't? wouldn't? (laughs) Sounds like good odds to me. Yeah. But the other particularly interesting thing that I actually didn't know about that I learned there, and this, of course, may or may not be true, (laughs) is that... The expression, the full Monty. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Just so so we can get the, our etymological content in on right. this episode. That's important. The full Monty may be connected with him, Monty. Well, for one of two reasons, but the, the one they mention is that it reflects his preference for a large breakfast, even when on campaign before going into battle. You have Not just for full, himself, but for his troops. His troops he wanted yeah. his troops to have, have a full, full breakfast. Monty. Yes, so the, full the full Monty. Yes, the full breakfast. Yep. The other possibility that people suggested is that it is, a, again, this is a, a World War II reference, but it's a suit that you would get as you became demobilized from the army. And mm. they were made, made by a tailor named Montague Burton. Hmm. And so it was, and it was a full three-piece suit, including waistcoat. So, and that somehow became full nudity due to irony. Well, I guess it's the idea of yeah. I think the transition to to the nudity was only with the movie, really. So this term, actually, by the way, I should mention, is surprisingly recent. There is not a textual occurrence of of the phrase the full Monty before nineteen eighty two, I believe. Okay. Okay. It was probably a little bit earlier than that, but that's not much before the movie. So tying it to Montgomery does seem a little odd. Yes. Right. All right. Well, there's your etymology. So we don't want to keep you forever and ever and ever. So let's move swiftly past London. Uh, <laughs> oh, wait. One last uh, thing in London. All right. We departed London from the oh, yeah. British Library. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I have to mention this because... Uh, in the the exhibit there, the the was it the treasures of the British Library included the Gawain manuscript, which is obviously a big influence on me. The only manuscript that shows the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight story. Yes, and so seeing open that, to the picture to of the picture of the Green Knight, the Green Knight holding his, his own head. head. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it really is amazing. Yes. And I know a lot of people, you know, there's a sort of tradition of making fun of this manuscript. The illustration this, in this manuscript is kind of crude, but I think they're wonderful. Mm-hmm. I think it's a brilliant manuscript, and I was really moved to see it. Mm-hmm. The whole exhibit of the Treasures of the British Library was amazing. There was just wonderful stuff in it. We weren't allowed to take pictures, which I deeply regret, though. It's fair enough, but mm-hmm. but I was sorry to see that. But it was uh, it was really a lot of amazing stuff in there. Yes. I want to just say the one thing I will say about London is to continue with the theme that we've already stated from VidCon, we also met up with a number of people there that we had only ever previously known through Twitter. So we met up with some academics after the British Museum, Mm -hmm. and then we went met up with some other friends, um, a couple of old grad school friends, but also um, one person who we only knew through Twitter at the British Library. 
And in both cases, it was wonderful to see them. It was just like meeting old friends. Yeah. It was wonderful to hang out. And that theme is going to continue. And it was just, it was great to just go somewhere and be like, hey, I already know people here mm -hmm. and they're great. And just, we hung out at a pub with Liz Gloin and Ellie Mackin and Amelia Dowler. And that was just, you know, it was just so pleasant. It was just so nice. Mm -hmm. And then we met Thea Cocker at the British Library along with our other friends. And we just, yeah, it was great. Two old grad school friends of yeah, mine, Damien, Damien and, Fleming and, and uh, Tuya. Tuya and 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 so anyway. So we left London to stay with Tuya. Mm -hmm. She took us from the British Library to uh, her home in Leicester. Leicester. And Tuya and James and Dean, whom you have met if you have listened to all of this podcast, because James spoke with us about acousmatic music ages ago. I will put a link to that podcast. It's a very he, early episode. Yeah, but he, he works on modern music and he te he's now teaching at the University of the University de Montfort. Montfort? What? How do they pronounce it? Montfort? I don't know. <laughs> Simon de Montfort, yeah. but in some British way of pronouncing it, which is in Leicester. In Leicester. And he's teaching there. And so so I'll, I'll put a link to that episode. But we stayed with them and their kids, and that was great. Mm -hmm. Quick highlights from Leicester, because we really have to move on. Well, so Leicester, you may well know, is the place with all the hoopla about uh, Richard III being uncovered in a parking lot. Yes. Which I had, to be honest, completely forgotten about until we were wandering and two years like, okay, now we're going to, I'll show you around Roman Leicester and medieval Leicester because, of course, it's England. Everywhere has Roman and medieval stuff. As callow North Americans, this is <laughs> continually surprising to me. But genuinely, until we went to the main cathedral, I had forgotten that King Richard III was yes. there. And then we get there and it's like, oh, wait, the tomb. <laughs> right. <laughs> where he was reburied. Okay. And that was pretty cool to see. Yes. And also there was the church of St. Mary de Castro. That Jeffrey Chaucer, Chaucer was maybe married maybe in. Maybe married in. <laughs> <laughs> it's very tenuous. <laughs> I still think it's interesting. <laughs> and there was the ruins of, a, of Roman baths. That was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the museum was unfortunately closed for refurbishment. That was sort of a theme on our trip. But it was still neat to see the, uh, the location. While there, we took a day trip to Nottingham, so, yes. and that was pretty fun. Obviously, all the Robin Hood stuff. Mm -hmm. Again, the castle closed for refurbishment, so we couldn't go into it. But we saw the caves underneath mm -hmm. Nottingham when we did a tour of some caves. Mm -hmm. That was really cool. That was a highlight for the kids, too. They really yep. enjoyed that. Yeah. Nottingham is built on sandstone, basically. So people dug all these caves mm -hmm. in. And it was known as, and I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sorry, but it, uh, the, the Celtic previous name for the, the place is Tiguo Kobauk, which means house or place of caves. Mm -hmm. And this place is first mentioned, just in terms of the Anglo-Saxon stuff, by Asser, who was the uh, biographer of King Alfred. Mm, right. So it goes right back. Goes right back. And we also had a pint in what may be the oldest pub in- The oldest inn. The, I will oh, say it okay, says okay. the oldest, the oldest inn. inn. The oldest inn in England. It's ye old trip to Jerusalem inn. The old trip. Yes, which should be the old trip to Jerusalem Which is inn. built into the wall of Nottingham Castle. In one of these caves, yeah. basically. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, that was a lot of fun. And met up with another friend from Twitter there too. England in particular, we built around meeting up with, old fr with friends from Twitter and- yeah. Uh, I'm glad we did because it was great. So from Leicester, we rented a car, which was its own terrifying <laughs> excitement because I got to drive on the wrong side of the road around roundabouts. And oh, my God, it was really, really scary. But we hit nothing and was I was only honked at like three times in the whole trip. So I think that was pretty good. Mark was a very good navigator. <laughs> As was the sat nav, but I needed both Mark and the sat nav. <laughs> I needed, I needed help. Except when we guided you into a pedestrian only. No, but that was when the sat nav was off. Oh, yeah. And so that was the whole problem. And then I walked down the sat pedestrian only street and had to be ushered back out by a <laughs> stern old lady. But we went to uh, the, down to the Cotswolds to stay with other friends from Twitter whom we'd mm -hmm. never met and uh, turned up at their house and stayed with them and they were great. And their their house, by the way, is supposedly built with 
timbers from a Viking ship that was scuttled at that point in the Thames, because that's basically as far as you can go with a ship upstream on the Thames with a reasonably large sized ship. It gets too shallow after that point. And so they scuttled their ships there to prevent people from passing that point. And in later times, those timbers supposedly were dredged up, dredged and, up and used to build buildings. Warehouses, warehouses. for the shipping that was going, yeah. going on in that place. And so they've got these exposed timbers, which legend says are Viking timbers. Yes. Who knows if they really are or not, but it's pretty darn cool. It's a cool. neat story. <laughs> <laughs> and I think... To be honest, my highlight from the Cotswolds in general was just how damn picturesque it all was. Yes. The buildings, the cottages, the stone buildings mm -hmm. were just gorgeous. They really were. In spite of the fact that all of England was undergoing a an extreme drought. <laughs> and heat wave, yeah. And heat wave. And so the, the famous, you know, rolling green... We're kind of yellow. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of yellow. <laughs> yeah. But it was still good. We took a day trip to uh, Sirencester, which is... Roman Corinium, which apparently is a really big deal that I didn't know yeah. anything about before we went. <laughs> and there's a museum there. It, it was a Roman camp, a Roman town, and there's been a lot of excavations. And we only went there because we happened to be staying nearby. And we thought, and Mark found it on the tour guide and said, hey, look, it's got some Roman and Anglo-Saxon stuff. Let's go. And we go. And it's an amazing museum. Yes, just stunning. Stunning mosaics. Oh my goodness, they were gorgeous. They really were amazing. And and just other things, including, um, I think one of the highlights for me was a version of the Sator Square, mm -hmm. which is this thing. It's this palindromic square. Now, the version they have in Sirencester is not the only one. It's not the oldest one. There's an older version in Pompeii. Ah, okay. But it's one of the older ones. And it's a, a palindromic square very palindromic in that it's five five letter words sator arepo tenet opera rotas yeah and so it's and a it five reads, by five square and it reads the same if you go across horizontally if you go vertically if you go diagonally it reads the same and you can flip it and it reads the same so mm -hmm. it's very cool yeah and it <laughs> Barely makes grammatical sense. Um, as they say, one likely translation is the farmer or repo has as work wheels a plow. That is, the farmer uses a plow as his form of work. Sator means sower. A repo is a hapax legomena, a first and only one word, hmm. a likely proper name. Tenet means holds, opera is works, and rotas is wheels. So you can't you can make grammatical sentence out of it. But, I mean, mostly probably those words were chosen because you can do this yes. unlikely thing with them. It's wordplay. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's a very famous square uh, and palindrome. I have a version of it because a family friend who's an artist uh, did a cal calligraphic version of it for me ages ago because it's Latin and she thought it would be cool for me. And then to go and see this version that was scratched into a uh, wall painting and is held in the Sirencester Museum. And to be like, oh, that. There it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> was really cool. And yeah, the, the mosaics were astonishing. There was some great Anglo-Saxon stuff, some, mm -hmm. some grave goods and jewelry and King Alfred coins and mm -hmm. other stuff like that. Yeah, some beautiful stuff. And I had no expectations whatsoever when we went. <laughs> like I didn't, we were just going. And the, the town itself is really cool too. It's yeah. a really cool medieval town. Yeah. But anyway, it was, yeah. We also did a day trip to Oxford. Mm -hmm. This was definitely planned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I had heard of Oxford before yes. we went. You know, we wanted to see the... Oxford. The Oxford, the colleges and like, you know, buildings. We went there and... just to sort of stand in Oxford and see Oxford. Yes. And we did that. It was great. Yeah. Though very dusty and... Dry. Not, <laughs> and not, not green. <laughs> yes. Except for the quads, which were mysteriously green, very green. In spite of the uh, hosepipe ban. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> apparently that does not apply to Oxford colleges. Yes. We also, of course, went to the Ashmolean Museum. Mm -hmm. And the main attraction for me there, of course, was seeing the Alfred Jewel. Mm -hmm. This is a jewel that is thought to, it probably is, uh, the sort of decorated end of what's known as an astle. King Alfred mentions this in the preface 
of one of his translations into English from from a Latin, important Latin text. And he says he's sending these copies of this translation out to all parts of his kingdom. And each one will contain one of these astles, which is basically a stick with a little duel on the end. And you use the stick to sort of follow along the words as you read. So this was part of his educational program. He wanted to make people literate. Mm -hmm. But the jewel itself. But the jewel itself is just amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. So there's kind of this inlaid enamel figure on the front covered by a clear crystal, polished crystal. And the casing is made of gold and it has an inscription on it that says uh, basically Alfred made me. And it's particularly important to me because it is connected to Alfred's literacy program and, and, and the sort of literature and text of the Anglo-Saxon period. And it's just an amazingly beautiful thing. Yeah, it really is. I didn't know much about it before we came, mm -hmm. but it, it, it was lovely. And the Ashmolean also, much like the British Museum, has way more stuff than it has any right to. And I mean that literally, in particular of Greek and Roman stuff. Like yeah. the Anglo-Saxon stuff, I don't have, like, of course, British museums have Anglo-Saxon okay. stuff. Why this, would it go anywhere else? No, it's completely yeah. legitimate. But the Greek and the Roman stuff, you're like, this is really, and especially the Greek stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that a lot of the Roman stuff stayed in, in Italy, but a lot of the Greek stuff, most, so much of the Greek stuff came to England. And so you go into the Eshmolin and there's this one case as you're going down into the Greek and Roman area. There's just all these vases that are grave vases. And they have a sort of description of what, what this is and what kind of thing these vases are. And then there's like, I don't know, 80 of them, just 100 of them. Case. In just one case. Not individually labeled because there's too many. They can't individually label them all. And every single one of them is like, you know, a red figure or black figure beautifully illustrated vase that could totally be discussed at length, right? It has an interest depicting a myth, or... a myth or a lot of them have uh, domestic images mm -hmm. on them. This is the particular kind of vases they are. And really interesting. Every single one of them, you know, could be the topic of a class. Mm -hmm. But there's so many of them that they've just put them all in one case and been like, hey, look at that. And then you move on <laughs> and you go to the case that has all the vases with Heracles' labors in it. And every one of them is one that, again, mm. is, is a whole class is worth of discussion. So it wasn't as overwhelming as the British Museum and it was earlier in the day. So I think I was a little stronger, <laughs> but it was still like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is ridiculous, totally ridiculous. So anyway, so we looked around that and those were the things that kind of stood out for me. There is lots of stuff, but. But the Alpha Jewel was the one particularly yeah. notable piece. And the other stuff was just like a bunch of cool stuff. Um, all right. And then on to... We went to, north. To the north. To the north. We drove up the hot, the, the uh, motorway and the signs kept saying the north, all in capital letters. So we followed all the signs to the north <laughs> <laughs> to get to... Um, we went to the this place called the Yorkshire Yorkshire Sculpture Park where there was a tweet up of a whole bunch of Twitter friends. And that was definitely a day of all these people that we'd known forever, but never seen in per person. And it was fabulous. That was just, it was in some ways very much the highlight of the entire trip, I mm -hmm. think for me to hang out and just spend time walking around this really cool place that I've seen them meeting up. All these UK friends meet up there every year. A bunch of them do. And I've watched them meet up for years and years and years and felt really sad that I wasn't there. And then suddenly we were there. And then we went home. We, we left our previous hosts from the Cotswolds with great sadness to part from them. But then we went to new hosts who were in Bury, just north of Manchester in a village called Nangreaves and stayed with them for four or five days. And I think my highlights, we went into Manchester and it was fun, mm -hmm. but I saw another old grad school friend and her kids there. Mm -hmm. I think my highlight of that time was just partly the village itself, Nangreaves, which is right. this tiny little village with just these old mm -hmm. mill houses, mill mm -hmm. workers' houses, which is really neat and beautiful. And also the walk we went on on the hills mm -hmm. nearby, just a, a ramble mm -hmm. and through the sheep farm fields. And that well, was and beautiful. just, you know, staying up till all hours of the night. Talking. Talking with, and drinking gin. <laughs> yeah, that was really good too. 
But in particular, we also took a day trip to Liverpool, which I enjoyed, but <laughs> I don't think I enjoyed it as much as you enjoyed no, it. No, because as I've said before, I'm a huge Beatles fan. So I saw, you know, we went on a, a sort of bus tour. You and, and Michael, who yeah. we were staying with, yeah. And we went to various famous Beatles sites, all their childhood homes, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. And yeah, we saw the shelter in the middle of the roundabout behind which a pretty nurse sold poppies from a tray. And yeah, it was it was amazing. We, you know, we saw the childhood home of Paul McCartney, which is which now belongs to the National Trust because it's, a you know, an important national historical place, because that's where so many of the Beatles songs were written. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was that was also a very moving experience to to see that place. Oh, and the Cavern Club, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was very for me very much uh, a a, uh, you a know, pilgrimage. A pilgrimage, mm -hmm. yeah, a very special trip. Mm -hmm. I'll put a, a the little montage up of um, Mark outside of all of the special all of the places the pictures taken of him <laughs> grinning the biggest grin in the entire world at every single place. It's a very clear example. Uh, depiction of how very happy you are to be in all of those places. And then the last place we visited before we left was uh, Filey, which was the, it's the east coast of England near Scarborough, I guess. Very much the uh, English seaside. A, a, a very old fashioned English, English seaside town. Yeah. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was just great. Mm -hmm. We had fish and chips overlooking Proper the fish sea. And chips. Very good. And... We walked on the shore and we had ice cream and then we had tea mm -hmm. in a proper tea shop overlooking the sea. That was mm -hmm. the best tea I've ever had because we were so <laughs> tired and so thirsty and so hot. And somehow tea was amazing. <laughs> oh, and I should say on the way to Filey, mm. we stopped oh, yeah, that was cool. at the Battle of Towton battlefield. So the Battle of Towton was a major battle in the War of the Roses, mm -hmm. kind of a decisive one. And it was the bloodiest battle on English soil mm -hmm. in all history. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they have uncovered various artifacts from this location. But it was fought in winter mm -hmm. in, in, you know, in the in early spring, storm. I think, or something. Yeah. 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 And uh, But now it's just these fields. It's, beautiful, it's just farmer quiet, fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they were very, you know, ripe grain, mm -hmm. um, waving fields of ripe grain. But there's plaques talking about what, yeah. what happened there yeah. and things. And it's quite neat to see it and yet there's nothing to see yeah but that which is interesting in itself to yeah. sort of realize that around any corner you know it's just a field and yet mm -hmm. this is a place where people died and that's just a thing that's yeah. how the yeah. world works you know that it's, yeah. it doesn't leave a mark mm -hmm. it doesn't change the world in a way that is perceptible even though such amazingly important things happen there you know, you sort of feel like the world should be, that the, the ground should be marked with the blood. And yet it's not. It's just a grain field. Yep. And I think that's kind of interesting in itself. If you want to learn more about it, we'll put a link to our friend Michael's blog post describing the battle. And uh, it's really quite interesting. And that was pretty much the end of our trip. I've We've left out various meetings with other Twitter friends Trust me, Twitter friends, we do not mean to leave you out because every one of those meetings was amazing and wonderful. Yes. But we can't talk about everything. But we saw a bunch of people. We stayed with people. Everyone was more hospitable and more wonderful than we could hope they would be. And then we flew home hmm. and went back to Toronto and then drove up to Sudbury through forest fires. Yes. Because there's a lot of forest fires near us near right now, or there were. I think most of them are under control now, but they weren't for a while. And, you know, that was, we were gone for 22 days. It was a big chunk of July and uh, picking up the pieces of real life. But, you know, it's back to work now and we're mm -hmm. prepping for the fall term. At teaching term teaching and admin term. and all of that stuff. And new videos coming along. Mm -hmm. You're working on one, which is going to be a slightly different and unusual because it's coll uh, collaboration. So yes. that's going to be coming up towards the end of August. And then we'll get back into regular videos in, in September. September. As I said, there's the video about the place name etymologies if you'd like to, if you'd like to see that. But yeah, coming back to real life has been a bit of a terrible, <laughs> terrible letdown. But other than that, <laughs> but it was really, really fun. I mean, it was the first time we've gone on a trip with the family out of the country it's the first time 
I've gone on a trip more than two days long that I did not bring work along with me mm -hmm. since our honeymoon 18 years ago. Um, it was pretty special. And I want to say also that in some ways it was a trip in memory of your father, yes. whose legacy to us made it possible and who always valued travel yes, a lot. Yes, he did. He, he really yeah, valued travel. We went on some amazing trips when we were kids. Yeah. And, uh, and I think he would have been glad to know that we were taking the kids on that trip. Yeah. So it was a wonderful time. I hope this recap of it has not been too, <laughs> too <laughs> self-indulgent on our part. But uh, we'll put up a whole bunch of pictures and links to the various things we saw. And you will see, I suspect, some of these things appear. You know, it was in many ways a research trip, too. Yes. Not so much so that I felt I could charge it to my university or anything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but enough that we, we did get some material. Yep. And f we will be returning to business as usual soon with some recaps of videos in our usual style mm -hmm. coming up in September. Also some interviews. We have at least three interviews planned, I believe, already. Mm -hmm. Not completely planned, but that I think you'll find very interesting. And we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. So on that note, I hope you also had a wonderful summer. Do let us know if you are thinking of going any of the places we have gone, because we would love to regale you with much more detailed information about all the things you should see and how amazing <laughs> it really, really was. <laughs> and we'll be back soon in September for season four. <laughs> Bye for now. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.elliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>